thank you very much for agreeing to, to have a chat. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I can see from straight away with the sock issue, uh, there's a blue sock and a red sock. Now, if they're randomly chosen, have you ever actually randomly chosen equal? Sorry. Yes. Yes. I have. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it happens. It happens. The right number of times. Right. It's, does that mean you, you've plotted it? There's a sort of distribution. I'm not that nerdish. No, no, no fair enough. Before we, before we start properly, um, I, I was just outside and I, and I put your name uh, into, into Google and a few images have come up, um, but my favourite one is the one I'm about to, to show you uh, because someone had very kindly uh, has created a, um, a sort of a sculpture, as it were, of, of you. And I've managed to find that image. Oh, there we are, that's it. No. Jesus sweat. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's definitely photos of you in the background. Um, but that looks nothing like you. Thank you for that. Well, yes. no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> That is nothing like you. But the second image, the second image that came up, if we, if we can stick with my slides for a second, because I can show everyone the second image uh, that came up, which is one of my favourite pictures, actually, which is, looks a lot more like you, uh, albeit... Um, <laughs> OK, that really is me. <laughs> yes. So this was taken last year, is my understanding. <laughs> it's been a stressful year. No, so... Um, I, I, how old? How old is, is Richard here? I would say fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. And did young Richard want to be a scientist? Mm, sort of, but not really very much until I got to Oxford. That was when I really started to want to be a scientist. Okay. So what, what, what did you want to be when you were fourteen? No, I, I did want to be a scientist, but it wasn't a very strong desire at that time. Okay. Okay. And, I, and I was a choir boy then in the in the chapel choir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That begs so many questions, but we'll... Uh... <laughs> so, uh, now that would suggest a, a religious upbringing, or...? Not particularly. I mean, I, I went to religious schools, but I wasn't, it, it wasn't forced down my throat. It wasn't as I was a Roman Catholic or a Muslim. Okay, right. Um, <laughs> and did, did that mean that at that, that age 14 or 10, 14, you, you would have believed? Would you have been a believer? Yes. I mean, everybody was at that age. Yes. Right. Okay. In, in, I, I wasn't. I was, I was well, good for you. I no. Mean, you, were, you, were, you were ahead of your time. I, well, I like to think An so. early I, developer. All it was was my parents were too lazy to take me anywhere near a church. Yes. So uh, uh, I was, I was, I've never read the Bible. Never read the Bible in my entire life. But, um, so so you uh, would have sort of been a, a believer at that, that point. What, what's your evolution in terms of, of losing that belief then? Well, I suppose at about the age of nine, I learned from my mother that there were lots of different religions and the one that I happened to have been brought up in was only one. So I kind of twigged at that point that they couldn't all be right. Okay. And, and, um, but it, I didn't quite make the next step, which is maybe none of them are. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of then drifted towards a, a deism, a sort of feeling that I was very impressed with the living world and how beautifully designed everything seemed to be. And so I thought there must be some sort of uh, creator but I didn't subscribe at that point to Christianity or anything. And then I got, went back to Christianity when I was confirmed at the age of 13. Oh. Uh, in, 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 into the Church of England and was prepared for confirmation by a, a very nice Anglican priest. The Anglican Church is really very decent, I mean, unlike most of its competitors. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm very ignorant about this. So, so I, what, what, what does being confirmed involve? Uh, it involves a bishop. Um, putting his hand on your head and saying um, something like, defend, O Lord, this thy child with thy heavenly grace, okay. that he may, I don't know. It, it's, it's supposed to um, confirm what the, the vows that your godparents took when you were baptized as an infant who didn't know any better. So if the bishop just put his hand on your head, you got off quite lightly, really, didn't you? Because they're... Um... <laughs> <laughs> They're not known for keeping their, their, their hands themselves, let's be honest. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Should we move on? I think yeah, that's... <laughs> oh, dear. We're going to have such fun. That's such a weekend. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if we go back to my slides again, because I, I'm going to... Uh, the, the next slide I'm going to show you is, uh, is the first... This is the first science book that I actually bought, uh, which is... Your book. Oh, good. And I, I don't know if... Cool. 
but I didn't read it. What's it about? No, 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 no. <laughs> 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 so, um, and this was the cover, actually, of my actual edition. So I don't know if you remember. Um, I, I assume that's not first edition. Uh, of oh, it could well be a first edition. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, my goodness, right. Well, In that which was... case, it's worth a lot of money. Right. Um, <laughs> I need to make a phone call. So, um, <laughs> so, so it's a fantastic book. Obviously, it's a, it's a complete game changer in many, many ways. And I'm always fascinated when, when I speak to somebody who's had that kind of success in terms of when you wrote that book, did it feel something special? Did it feel like this was just a book you were writing? Did you think it was going to change the world? What, what, was, what was the feeling? I did jokingly refer to it to my friends as my bestseller as I was writing it. Um, and I, I suppose everybody, every first author hopes their book may be a bestseller. Um, and uh, it was designed to appeal to a, a wide audience. It was designed to um, correct a very common mistake that was going around at that time. So I, that was my main motivation for writing it. Th this was the mistake that natural selection favors the group or the species and the collective good. So the book is actually, well, it's called The Selfish Gene. It's mostly about altruism mm. and cooperation. Uh, and the idea is that selfish genes give rise to altruistic and cooperative individuals. So the misconception that I was correcting was that uh, cooperation and altruism are favored because they're good for the species. The species or the group that has altruistic individuals is the one most likely to survive in competition between groups. And that was being put about by Conrad Lawrence and Robert Ardrey and various others at the time. And it's just flat wrong. And that's what, what I was writing about. And, and I, know, I know nothing of evolutionary biology. When, that, when you were putting that together and that, that came out, was that a controversial notion within evolutionary biology at that time? Well, in a funny sort of way, because as I say, these popular books were perpetrating that error and there were some serious books as well that were perpetrating that era. Uh, but I suppose there was a kind of orthodoxy which dated from the neo-Darwinian synthesis of the 1930s and 40s, uh, which did do what I did, which is emphasize the gene as the unit of natural selection. But they didn't do it in quite such an outspoken way as I did. It was, was sort of implicit in the neo-Darwinian synthesis of Fisher, Haldane, and Wright. Um, but I suppose I kind of gave it a, a more poetic spin. And it, and it is so... I'm going to embarrass you now. I'll try to embarrass you. It's so beautifully written, beautifully written, that for a f particularly for a first book, I mean, normally it takes a while for an author to develop a voice. When did you realise that, that you had that, that gift, as it were? Huh, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose... You have to write a lot at Oxford. I mean, you have to write, as an undergraduate, you write a, a, a long essay every week. Uh, and you read it, at least in my day, you read it aloud, you don't anymore. You read it aloud, and so you hear your own words. And you can hear if it, if it reads well. Okay. And I suppose a weekly practice at that helps. And how old were you when that came out, roughly? About, well, sorry, the how, how old were you when Selfish Gene? Oh, uh, 35. Amazing, amazing. Now, my, I have an aunt whose name's Jean. <laughs> and she's not at all selfish. <laughs> How would you explain that? Got me there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, as I say, I, I understand very little uh, about evolution of biologists. However, uh, um, uh, a zoologist on, on, uh, 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 had a chat with me uh, just a few minutes before we started, and he had what sounded like a very sensible and serious question about evolution. Uh, so I think it's Colin. So where, where's Colin, our zoologist? Hands up, Colin. Uh, okay, Colin, if you'd like to come to this microphone uh, in the middle here, and uh, then you can put your question to, to Richard, because I, I was very scared I wouldn't be able to phrase it properly. So uh, uh, this yes. is Colin. You, you were looking for things to ask Richard about, and, and I'm really curious, I think, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, that I read the phrase in some of your work, the evolution of evolvability, or the idea that some groups, like the Coleoptera in particular, might be better at evolving than some other groups. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on that and some of the mechanisms that might be involved in, uh -huh. in that sort of acceleration. Right. When I said just now that uh, it was a fallacy to say that 
natural selection favors some groups rather than others. There are certain senses in which something a bit like that happens, and the evolution of evolvability might be one of them. Um, there are some groups, you mentioned Coleoptera, that's beetles, as you could say mammals, perhaps, or insects as a whole, um, who, once they develop their body plan, which means really develop a system of embryology for giving rise to the body plan, that body plan can be extremely fertile in generating evolutionary diversity. Other body plans are less fertile in generating evolutionary diversity. And so, in a sort of a way, there is a kind of higher order natural selection whereby the world becomes filled with those kinds of animals whose embryology equips them to evolve and diversify. This is very, very different from ordinary natural selection. Ordinary natural selection is about self-interest at the level of the genes, about reproductive success. I'm now talking about the success of whole clades. A clade is a a whole branch of, of, a, of a tree, like the mammals, or like the insects, or like the beetles, like the mollusks. Um, and it does seem to be true that certain kinds of body plan, which sort of means certain kinds of embryology, once they've be arisen by ordinary natural selection processes, once they've arisen, then there's a kind of bursting forth of evolutionary plasticity, um, segmentation, the, origin, the first animal that became segmented, you know, things like um, arthropods, insects, and earthworms, and indeed vertebrates, are segmented. The, the body plan of a, of a millipede, you have a head at one end and a tail at the other end, and then a whole lot of segments in the middle, it's like a train with trucks. That seems to be a very successful body plan. Lots and lots of animals do it, and once the segment, segmentation body plan had arisen, there was a great flowering of evolutionary diversity uh, using the segmented body plan. You get things like lobsters, which have the segmented body plan, but in, unlike a millipede, where most of the segments are identical, every segment is different, or most of the segments are, are different. But, uh, so that's what I mean by the evolution of evolvability. Colin, are you happy with that? Yes, there's a thumbs up from Colin. Right, very, very good, thank you. I mean, I, I know very little about mechanisms of, of evolution, but obviously there's a vast amount of evidence suggesting that it's, that it's the best theory we have at the moment. And sometimes when you meet believers in various religions and they go, oh, no, I don't believe in evolution, I'm actually quite open to it. I go, okay, so, so what's the opposite? And they go, well, there's a man with a big white beard. And I go, oh, for goodness sake, don't be so stupid. It is... And, and I don't know much about evolution. When, when you come against somebody who, who's, whose alternative is so um, sparse in terms of evidence, what, what, putting it mildly, um, what, how, what do you think? How do you deal with that? I think we should give up the man of the big white beard because it's too easy for them to just say, I mean, it's a kind of cliche. They say, oh, well, you think we believe in a man with a big, big white beard. And of course, they don't, at least not m most of them don't. Um, but... Uh, the, these people who, who refuse to believe in evolution, they normally don't know anything about it. Okay. Um, I've told before, I hope I didn't tell it here last year, the story of John Endler. Did I tell you John Endler's story, how a man he met on a plane? No, okay. tell us again. Um, John Endler is a distinguished evolutionary biologist. Uh, he's written the, m the most definitive book on natural selection in the wild. And he was once... Uh, traveling on a plane, an internal flight in America. He got talking to his neighbor, and his neighbor asked him what he did, and so he said he worked on guppies. And what do you do with guppies? And so he explained that he uh, has, works on these little, little fish in Trinidad, and um, he's found that in those streams where there are predators, the guppies are all drably brownly, brown colored. But in those streams where there happen not to be any predators, the male guppies become like peacocks, they become brightly colored. And so the interpretation is that when there are no predators, sexual selection, selection by females, is given free reign, and so the male guppies are free to develop the bright colors which appeal to females. But in the streams where there are predators, the predators exert 
where the predators eat the, the, um, the brightly colored males because they're easy to see. And so sexual selection um, takes a backseat. He didn't use the phrase sexual selection. He explained the, 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 the work he did, and he he's even went, he even explained his ingenious experiment where he actually transported guppies from a stream which had, n which had predators and put them into a stream which had no predators. And I think it took about 14 years for the guppies to develop the bright peacock colors. So it was a very, very fast uh, change. And the man listened to us, and he was fascinated. He said, gee, that's real interesting. <laughs> there must be some theory behind that. <laughs> So then Endler played his trump card. He said, yes, it's Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. And the man turned away and said, oh, I don't believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we can cut back to the slides for the moment. Uh, we have, uh, I think, Selfish Gene there. Um, so I found another, another picture of you uh, on the web. And as I say, I don't know very much about uh, evolution, uh, but um, I'm sure that... <laughs> You can't get rabbits that size, can you? <laughs> do, do you know what was going on there? Do you have any memory of Yes, that's what photographers do. They make you pose in silly positions. Um, that, that rabbit or hare um, is... A, is my, my wife owns it. She has a collection of fairground animals, carousel animals, oh, okay. which her mother collected. And these decorate the drawing room. And so as soon as a photographer sees that, he just can't resist getting me to pose in that stupid position. <laughs> we'll move on. OK. Um, so, God Delusion. Uh, now, what's interesting about this is that up until this point, you're writing about evolution, biology, and, and so on, I, I, I think. And, th and then you, you decide to do the God Delusion, which is, I think, quite a departure, in, in a sense. Yes. Can you tell us about that process, about, A, what, what gave you the idea, and, B, what were the... What were your publishers? Were they, were they very open to that? Did they think that was a terrible idea? What, what did people think? It was a departure in a way, but I suppose in a sense it also was a, just a continuation. I mean, godlessness is implicit in all the books I've ever written. Mm. This one, this is the first book that was made explicit. Um, publishers, I didn't talk to publishers at first. I talked to my literary agent, John Brockman, who's this sort of famous character in New York who publishers were all terrified of. When I pitched this idea to him, about um, 1998, I think, uh, he said, no, 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 that'll never sell in America. You can't possibly write that. Uh, um, that that's complete non-starter. So I instead wrote um, The Ancestor's Tale, which was a mammoth, mag mammoth book. Um, took me a long time. Um, and then, well, George Bush got elected, and uh, after about five or six years of George Bush, um, John Brockman got in touch with me and said, OK, now's the time for the God to <laughs> <laughs> But as for poor George Bush, I mean, nowadays one would say, come back, George Bush. <laughs> All is forgiven. <laughs> so so he, he... Brockman didn't think it was a great... Well, he, he then came round to the idea. But had the publishers themselves, they, they were open to it? Oh, well, by the time, by the time John uh, approved the idea, the publishers were keen. And, right. And, yes. And, and did you expect it to do what it did? Or did you think it would be a voice in the wilderness? Or uh, how did you think that would play? I, I don't do expecting like that. I'm not really sure that I, I did expect anything. Um, it, it has sold, uh, actually, even more than The Selfish Gene. Uh, and, um, what kind of numbers? Do you know how many roughly? Uh, uh, yeah, the numbers uh, about, uh, of the, pr the correctly, legitimately published books is about three million, um, mostly in English and quite a few in German, quite a few in Korean, actually. Um, but those figures are all dwarfed by the Arabic translation, um, which is not a legitimate translation. I get no royalties from it. It's an illegal translation and it's only available on the web, as far as I know. It's a PDF, and it's been downloaded now 13 million times. Amazing. Amazing. And 
what's, what's behind that, do you think? Uh, well, one can hope. I mean, uh, I, I think there probably is a, a kind of hidden groundswell of irreligion in the Muslim world. Um, I get a lot of encouragement from Iran, which is not an Arabic-speaking country. Um, I'm told that about a third of that major figure of Arabic translation is in Saudi Arabia. And um, so there does seem to be a, a mismatch between, maybe between what we're told about what people in those countries believe and what they actually do. And so even with the three million, which is colossal with the, the, the God delusion, looking back, I mean, that, that seemed to me to, to be a real catalyst for uh, the skeptics movement, the atheist movement uh, kind of really taking hold in a way that certainly I didn't think I'd seen it sort of really get traction before. Was, was that your experience as well? I'd like to think so. I mean, I, I, Sam Harris's book came before it, and, and I think Sam Harris's the, the End of Faith is a terrific book, and I should have thought that maybe the two of them together with Dan Dennett's and Christopher Hitchens is all, all four of them, perhaps. Okay. And, and looking back, are you surprised at the, the reaction to it? Um, I don't know which direction I should be surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gratified to have sold three million copies. I'm disappointed that there are, that there are still so many religious people around, although it gets less so. I mean, the, the, the figures are going our, in our direction, they're going in the right direction. Mm. I think the number of people who don't subscribe to any religion in America is now about 25%, um, which is as big as any particular religious denomination. I had this idea. Um, I don't want you to think to this. So, so in, I don't know how it works in other parts of the world, but in the UK, we vote in our government for, was it four years, I think we vote in our government. What we could do is vote in a state religion for the same period of time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a luxury to be able to, to vote the government out every four years. I mean, in the case of Brexit, it's forever, it's for keeps. We're well, stuck with it. I know. You and I could talk about Brexit, but I, I think... Uh, It'd be uh, boring for everybody yes, else. Yes, yes. Um, so basically, it recently won the award uh, for the worst sceptical campaign uh, in the entire world, was the, uh, the Brexit campaign. Um, so you're not, you're not pro my idea of voting in a religion, or indeed a lack of religion, for four years? Well, I think we could probably go for the flying spaghetti monster, maybe, or the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great, wouldn't it? Great. Uh, so talking of such things, if we can cut back to my slides, um, as I say, put Richard Dawkins into, into Google, and uh, this was another uh, picture that... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, how do we feel about this one? Yeah, not a very good Photoshop job, I think. The, the head looks kind of screwed on. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to it for a minute? Because I'd like to look... There we are, there we are. P.G. Um, Woodhouse had a rather nice phrase. He looked as if he'd been poured into his clothes and they'd forgotten to say when. <laughs> <laughs> um, fair enough. And uh, um, so the next picture, next picture, uh, is of, um, uh, well, somebody that you may or may not recognise. Uh, we're going back a little bit in time, but it does come up when we put Richard Dawkins uh, into, uh, into Google. Uh, who on earth is that? He's <laughs> a rather good-looking chap, uh, <laughs> I think. So I I'm don't remember that. When was that? Wh where? When, when, uh, when and I, where? I think yeah. it was the early 90s. Um, I, on my name badge, uh, it says Richard Wiseman, so it's definitely me. And... <laughs> What I can't work out is which of us appear to be stealing the picture. That's the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's, a, there's a framed picture between us, as if we've taken it down off the wall. <laughs> and either you've got it or I've got it. I don't have any memory Can of that. Can you see what the picture is? I can't see. I can't, I can't, I can't see even on no. here, actually. No. Um, but it looks like we've taken it off the wall. Um, I, I don't remember that event at all. I don't know whether you've got any memories. I don't, I'm not sure we even, it looks like they were kind of squeezing the picture between us. Yes. <laughs> May yeah. have been a, a joint effort. Yes. Um, you don't have that picture, do you? Well, I can't see what it is. Uh, well, other than that, do you yeah. have it? Uh, that's the, um, 
I don't have it. So if I don't, I, so anyway, if you want it, if you have it, um, then then I could have it for a couple of weeks. But, um, <laughs> Uh, so yes, anyway, I have, I have, I have no, um, uh, and also the look on your face. Uh, I don't think I'm being the most exhilarating company uh, for you there. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that's there. Um, let, us, <laughs> let us move on uh, to, uh, to happier times. Um, Probably Know God, the uh, uh, atheist uh, bus campaign. And this was, this was rather fun. Do you want to, to talk us through th this and, and your yes. thoughts about it? Yes, um, this was an idea of a young woman called Ariane Sherin, who is a British journalist and comedian, and she had the idea of paying for advertisements to stick on London buses, and it was generalised beyond London to other major cities in Britain. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy yourself. That's that. And enjoy um, your the British Humanist Association, which is a kind of British equivalent of CFI, um, sponsored it, and I, I gave them some money. My, my British Foundation gave them some money um, as well, and it proved to be quite inexpensive, actually, to plaster London buses with these, th these things. Um, it was quite a successful campaign. And if we use that, that bus picture as a springboard into how you change people's minds, I mean, you have the God delusion, you have campaigns like that, you have meetings like this. Um, what, what do you think is the key to changing people's minds, to getting them to be more excited about science and reason? I'm not famous for being very good at that. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, what's, what's the key to failing at well, it? I, <laughs> we, the, I, I was once at a conference, it might have been at this conference, at an earlier year, and somebody looked really a little bit like you, Richard, actually. He gave a talk which said, was called Don't Be a Dick. Oh, yes. Phil, Phil Plate. Phil Plate. That's right, yes. yes. Um, and uh, he began by saying, uh, if somebody stands up and tells you you're a complete idiot, would you change your mind? And he asked for a show of hands, and of course, everybody said they wouldn't change their mind. And of course they wouldn't if you, if you asked, put, it, put the question that way. Um, but my answer to that would be, when you call, when you say, don't be an idiot to somebody who is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you may not change their minds, but if there are a thousand people listening in, if it's say a radio audience or something, you may change their minds. Um, and so it, it's not totally clear that it's a silly thing to demolish somebody in argument publicly because although they won't change their mind because they'll, be, they'll, they'll, they'll resent it, um, the public that's listening in may well change their minds. There may be a large number of people sitting on the fence who will, will change their minds. The, the time, I mean, looking back on when, when, when I've been an idiot, I did change my mind. I, I was an idiot when I was an undergraduate. I, I, I read the book Phenomenon of, the Phenomenon of Man by uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the French Jesuit priest. And it, it's a sort of work of euphoric prose poetry. Uh, some of you may have read it. And I was completely taken in by this book. I thought it was wonderful. And my, my style of writing my weekly Oxford essays changed as a result. I started to imitate Teilhard de Chardin. And then I read Peter Medawar's review of the phenomenon of man. So Peter Medawar, P.B. Medawar, um, Nobel Prize winning medical scientist. This is the greatest negative book review ever written. <laughs> you must read, if you even, I mean, don't bother to read the book itself, read the review. The, um, it is a fabulous review. I could, I could quote word for word, but I won't. Um, and I realized I've been a complete idiot. I've been, I've been fooled. I didn't, I didn't push back. I didn't say, I didn't resent it. I said, yes, I've been a fool. Um, and so I changed my mind. Uh, Peter Met Medawar, in, in this sense, was a dick uh, to Teilhard de Chardin and to people who've been fooled by him, like, like me. So um, I don't necessarily subscribe to the view that the only way to change people's minds is to be seductive and sweetly reasonable and um, try to uh, persuade you know, of course, I do sympathize with your position, and I quite agree with what you're saying. And, 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 but on, don't you think, on the one hand, you might be slightly wrong about this and slightly wrong about that? No, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm, ju I'm just so happy that you didn't go into counselling as a... Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't think the Richard Dawkins approach to counselling would be like, <laughs> um, There's a wonderful... Um, oh, who's that chap who does these sketches with a, with, on the phone? Um, Dom, Dom Jolly? No. No? Sit, what, one at a time, please. Yes, Bob, oh, Bob Newhart. Bob, 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 Bob Newhart. Um, and he plays the part of a, of a psychiatrist. And a young woman comes in and says that she's terrified of being shut up in a box, buried alive in a box. And um, so he, sa he says, um, I'm going to give you two words of advice. I want you to listen very carefully. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> You know, a friend of mine is a very experienced counsellor, I've been doing it about 50 years, and I said to him the other day, I said, what are you thinking for most of these sessions? It's hundreds of sessions, thousands of sessions with patients. And he said, I sit there for about half the sessions, and I think, Jesus, this really is all about you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, so uh, if we cut back to my slides. Uh, so I, I went on Twitter, I went on uh, the Facebook, and I asked uh, people what questions they would like to ask you. Uh, some of them uh, were not the most sensible questions, so let's get some of these out of the way, uh, first of all. Uh, is cheese on toast better than uh, grated cheese or sliced? Uh, we uh, won't be looking at that. That uh, reminds me of the first time I ever did a radio broadcast, mm -hmm. and it was one of those phone-in programmes. And the first question that was pitched to me was, are dogs better than cats? <laughs> I think that's a fair question. <laughs> well, I mean, you're a dog lover, aren't you? I love our dogs and cats. We can... <laughs> you, you, you split the room now. This is... Uh... We'll, we'll do a quick show of hands, because we'll find out from an evidence point of view. Uh, so hands up that cats are better than dogs. OK, down, hands down. Dogs are better than cats. Okay, hands down. Hands up you don't like taking part in those sorts of polls. Uh, yeah, yes, there we are. Um, I think that was the dog vote uh, on that. From an evolutionary perspective, which is better? That's a, that's a very bad question. Um, <laughs> you haven't seen some of the ones that are coming up, they're, to be fair. Right? <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're all, all animals are good at what they do. And, and uh, the, the, the question is, individual dogs have to be better than other individual dogs, and individual cats have to be better than individual cats. But there's no question about dogs being better than cats. Okay. Or, or vice versa. Uh, ask him if he believes in God, he's never really made it clear. Mm. <laughs> I have uh, to give that a lot of thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one, next one, I think is a, more, is a more serious one. There we are. What's the last thing that made you go, wow? Well, only yesterday I was writing um, uh, uh, my, my next book, and I was quoting Dan Dennett. Uh, who had a wonderful slide. Maybe you've seen his beautiful slide of uh, a termite castle, a termite mound, okay. and um, a, um, a man-made church, which is in somewhere in Spain, in Barcelona, I think. And they look almost exactly the same. Hmm. Uh, they, they've got turrets, they're sort of spir spires and Gothic spires and things. Different sizes, presumably. <laughs> Not relative to the builders. Oh. <laughs> um, as Carl von Frisch said, um, a termite mound relative to a, t a termite is like a skyscraper. Yes. Um, but Dan's point, which is a, a fascinating point, is that although these two cathedrals look very, very similar, one of them was built by design, by, by an architect, top down. Every detail of the church was planned by the architect. Whereas in the case of the termites, no individual worker termite had the foggiest idea what the final building would look like, and not even in their DNA was anything remotely approaching a, a plan of the building. The termites just do it by following little local rules. If you see a, if you see a little heap of mud, put another dollop of mud on the top. If it smells of such and such a pheromone, do this. If it smells of another kind of pheromone, do that. There is no plan. 
and yet the whole thing comes out looking as though it was planned. And that's a beautiful... Dan was using it for talking about um, his, his, his thing about um, mind. But you can also use it for an illustration for the way animals develop, em how em embryology develops. There is no blueprint. Em it, it's entirely wrong what school textbooks of biology tell you that DNA is a blueprint. It is not a blueprint. If it were a blueprint, it would be reversible. It would be there, there would be a plan somewhere. There is no plan. It, it, each cell follows its own little local rules. And the result of all these little local rules being locally obeyed is that somehow an embryo develops. And it's a very, very fascinating point. So that made me... And just seeing the, the picture of the cathedral and the termite mound together made me go, wow. And, and is that experience making you go, wow, is that something that regularly happens to you when you look at the complexity of... I'm a biologist, natural. how could it not? I mean, every, every, almost every time I look at a, at a, a creature, at a, at a camouflaged animal, at a, at a leaping panther, at a, a, a chameleon, um, I look down a microscope, wow, 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 all the time. Well, let's move on to our next question then, uh, away from uh, the wow, and uh, look at... Uh, does he not get bored of religious debate having done it for so long? Yes, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> but does it get a bit tedious, kind of trotting out? Well, no, I mean, I, I don't mind that. If, if, if somebody wants to have a decent argument, I, I don't mind that. Um, no, it's OK. okay. What's, what's the best argument you've ever heard for the existence of God? I honestly don't believe there is one. Um, there must be, there, but in turn, there must be ranked. I mean, there must be one which is better. I suppose the least bad is the um, is the fine tuning argument about the laws of physics. Um, we, I mean, some physicists will tell you that the physical constants, those numbers whose values physicists know, but which have no, so far, no rationale. They're just measurable numbers, like the gravitational constant and the weak force and the strong force and so on. Um, that if any of these numbers were even a tiny bit different from what they are, there would be no galaxies, there would be no stars, there would be no, um, n no chemistry, there would be no life. And, and some people like to interpret this fine-tuning argument as indicating that there must be a, d a designer. I mean, it's a terrible argument, of course, because it pushes back, I mean, you still have got to explain where the designer came from, it doesn't help. Um, and, but it, it, it then leads on to quite interesting points that physicists make, like the, the multiverse, where they postulate that there are lots of universes with different laws of, and, and constants of physics. And this is where the anthropic principle comes in. We have to be in one of that minority of universes which has laws and constants capable of giving rise to us. And, and so that, I mean, that's quite an interesting ar argument. But um, if, if, if there was a least bad argument for the existence of a creator, I suppose it would be, would be the fine-tuning argument. Very good, very good. Okay, if we can uh, go back to the uh, slides for a second. Now, given the, the multi-universe model, does that mean that... Um, I don't know if you buy into that, that model, but that, all these thousands and millions of universes, does that mean there's one out there uh, in which uh, you do actually look like that? <laughs> Is that like... No, you look like that. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, where are we going here? Um, so, uh, uh, there we are. Um, there we are, board of religious thing. Um, uh, there we are, perhaps uh, related to what we just said. In, in an infinite universe, is God a certainty? I'm not even certain I understand the question, but uh, well, Jeff Whelan, who's clearly a fool. In clearly a, a form. literally infinite universe, um, I suppose you have to say anything, is, any, anything will happen. I mean, um, that somebody said, somewhere in the universe there's a cricket team to beat the Australians. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I actually don't think, even in an infinite universe, I, I don't think that there's a, there's a creator God. What I do think is that, it, is that in, probably in this, in this universe, let alone an infinite one, in this universe there are plenty of creatures out there which would be considered gods as far as their superiority to us is concerned. I mean, they would be so superior to us that we might well be tempted to fall on our knees and worship them because... I mean, we're not all that well developed, and, and, and there's been plenty of time for uh, superior civilizations to, to, to evolve. 
And some people say, well, wouldn't that be God? No, it wouldn't, because that, that would be the product, however God-like they were, they would be the product of an evolutionary process or some kind of rational, incremental process, starting with simple beginnings. You've got to start with simple beginnings. And um, so I, I think it's an interesting argument to have with, with people. Mightn't there be godlike creatures in the universe? Yes, probably there are. But they didn't create it. They evolved in it just like we did. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one, let's have a look uh, here, is, uh, here we are, uh, from Facebook. What are you writing next? What are you working on? Atheism for children. <laughs> but I... I, I, I have two misgivings about this. What, one is that publishers won't like the title. Um, and I would, I would argue with them that it is such a controversial title, it would outrage people, probably get banned in various places, which would be good. Um, uh, it would stir up... Um, interest, a buzz of, it, of interest. So that's in favor of calling it atheism of children. The main disadvantage is that I'm told children don't like being called children. And so it's not the atheism that's the problem, it's the, it's the children. So atheism for young people. Um, if you use the word that I use to refer to them, you're never going to get it published uh, at all, because uh, I hate children. But, um, <laughs> uh, but I wonder what approach you're taking. Is it that the opening is sort of like a a dot to dot, uh, and then they look back and go, it just says, don't be stupid, uh, or something like that. <laughs> what, 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 what age group and what approach are you taking? I think about 12, 13, 14. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a kind of, um, I, I wrote a book for that age group called The Magic of Reality a few years ago. So it's sort of the same age group as that, illustrated in the same kind of way. But whereas that was all about science, this, is, this would be the kind of, young person's version of the God delusion. Oh, okay. And, and that means tackling each of the sort of major arguments that are made for God? Yes, I've, I've written about five chapters so far in very rough draft. Um, the first one is, how so there are so many gods, Thor and Apollo and Mithras and, and the Egyptian gods and the gods of the African jungle and the South Sea Islands and things. So um, to get the idea to the, to the to the young people that um, there are just so many different gods and there's no particular reason to choose their, their own one. And that lends itself to illustration, beautiful il illustrations of Aphrodite and Zeus and, and Thor with his hammer and things like that. Um, there's a book, there, there's a chapter called The Good Book, which is about the Bible and is a, a, full of all the horror stories, Abraham and Isaac and, and Jephthah and... and, and um, uh, the book of Job, and uh, all, the, all, all the horror stories about what a horrible individual character God is. Um, remember, I, 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 there's a story about Randolph Churchill. I think I told this in the, in the God Delusion, um, that Evelyn War and a brother officer in the army um, bet Randolph Churchill because he was such a... This Randolph Churchill was Winston Churchill's son, and he, he was an officer together with Evelyn Waugh. And he was such a bore that Evelyn Waugh and his friends bet him that he couldn't read the Bible all the way through, hoping it would keep him quiet. But it didn't keep him quiet because it, he kept on slapping his thigh and saying, God, isn't God a shit? <laughs> so. so that's that chapter. And then... <laughs> And, and then there are about four chapters on, uh, on evolution. Uh, and because I think one of the main reasons why anybody believes in God, it certainly applied to me until I was about 15, um, is the, the overwhelming sense that the, the living world looks so beautifully designed. There must be a designer. And so um, I, I, I really want to go to town on that and spend about four chapters there. I'm slightly worried about those chapters because the way I've written them Inevitably, the age groups, the age targets seem to have shifted a little bit in the older direction. Okay. And, and simply because the material is just that much more difficult to get across. I'm not quite sure how to solve that. So that's about as far as I've got. 
So when I was um, a kid, and this might sound very alien to Americans here, but you, 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 as most of you are, um, is um, that you'll understand this, that we would have re religious prayer in school assembly. And so if you're an atheist, as I was, you had to leave. You had to stand up and leave. And so they'd say, we're now going to pray, and like five or six of us would stand up and, and leave. It was a very strange thing. How old were you then? Um, I was at school, so uh, the other kids were about eight, but I was about 32. Uh, I was... <laughs> <laughs> it, was it was, they kept holding me back. No, um, no so I, I, would, I would be about eight or nine. So, so I was used to standing up in front of all these kids and just leaving um, because I didn't want to have prayer. It's, uh, it, was, it was very odd. So that, I that never happened in my... I mean, I, I did... I stayed away from chapel, but Ill illicitly. I mean, I, I, uh, first of all, I and a couple of friends started a campaign where we didn't kneel down. We just, we right. just sort of sat proudly like that. Um, and, um, and then I started just simply skipping chapel altogether. But, I, but there was no sort of oh, standing no. up and walking no, out. No, it, it, so it was myself and two Buddhists used to leave. Um, every, they were a lot of fun. Uh, so, um, <laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, so we stand and, and it got you used to standing up, actually, uh, for what you thought was right. There was something very fundamental about yes. standing up and going, OK, yes. I think that's the right thing to do. I think eight is bordering on being too young to know, actually. I, mean, I, was, I was very bright. Yeah. Very, <laughs> very bright. Very bright. Um, plus, you could go through all the other kids' bags and pockets when they were uh, praying, so it was... Uh, uh, so anyway, back to our questions, back to our questions. Uh, I think we're almost there. Uh, your favourite, this is uh, from John Archer, a Christian friend of mine. Uh, your favourite, uh, I guess it's biblical, uh, verse. Oh, gosh. Um, well, you know, atheists know the Bible so much better than Christians. Did you know that? So let me think. Um, one of St. Paul's epistles, well, I, just, I just used Jesus wept, didn't I, earlier on. But, um, um, one of St. Paul's epistles says something like, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I think that's a good quotation to throw at religious people. <laughs> do, do you hold um, any truck with the, that notion that some people say, well, the Bible is just, you know, ignoring all the God stuff, it's just a, 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 a way of living your life. It's, it's a moral uh, source. I hope it's not. I mean... <laughs> It, that would be a terrible recipe for life. It, it, it's, a, it's a dreadful book, actually. So um, if, 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 if an open-minded parent would come to you and say, I'm, I'm not going to give them the Bible, and you're not, you haven't finished your book on uh, Atheism for Children, what, what book would you, would you recommend, do you think? Oh, for a child. Dr. Doolittle, I think. Um, I've, I've got an essay on Dr. Doolittle in Science in the Soul, Comparing him to the young Darwin, and I, I think there was quite a similarity. They both um, were always sailing on ships of the same kind. The, the Beagle is very like the sort of ship that Dr. Doolittle would sail in and usually wreck. Um, and Dr. Doolittle was a very humane character, a very, a very altruistic, nice character. And Darwin was too. They both were very, very nice, gentle men, gentlemen. Um, so, if you haven't read Dr. Doolittle, and if you haven't read P.G. Woodhouse, please read both. And The Science in the Soul, of course. And finally, so we have literally um, a couple of minutes left. You have had this, and continue to have, this phenomenal career of influencing people all around the, the world. If, if you had a simple, or, or, or a way of simply expressing the message, expressing what you would want people to take from your books as a complete um, set, what, what would that message be, do you think? There is such a thing as the truth. The truth is to be discovered by science, and the truth is utterly wonderful. Richard Dawkins, it has been an honour, it's been a pleasure. Richard Dawkins! <laughs> Very Thank you. Richard Dawkins.